This morning, we're going to be going to the Old Testament together. I want us to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 7 together. Last week, we did a study on hospitality. We considered a New Testament passage out of Matthew and Jesus' feeding of the 5,000 and really the call scripturally for us to love, to love strangers. That's part of God's heart, okay? He is very relational. And he wants us to really care about those around us and the call to love our neighbors. That's something that we want to do well because it's something God has asked us to do. It's something that God has done himself. He stepped into our neighborhood. And aren't you guys glad? You guys ever think about that? He left heaven. (laughs) Okay? Like, I ain't coming back if I go someday. (laughs) Well, I'm going to come back with Jesus. But it's going to be cool because I'm going to be with Jesus. You guys understand that? It's one of those things God went to great lengths to save us. And it's one of those things he's asking us to do the same. Because there is a sacrifice. I'm going to give of myself to these strangers. I'm going to love these people that I don't even know. But that's the example we see in Christ. And I would encourage you guys, we're going to kind of hit on the reality of hospitality again this morning. But we're changing gears a little bit. And there's a lot that we discussed last week and a lot to consider. So if you missed study last week, we do have that up on our website. You guys can go and take that in. Next week, we're going to be in back in our study in 1 Corinthians. We've been working through Exodus and Corinthians this last year. And we're going to be hitting on the love chapter next week. You guys know what chapter that is? Man, you guys are so smart. And it really does come around the spirituals that we've been considering the spiritual gifts and just the reality of the body of Christ working together and us needing each other. And ultimately, all that we do and all that God's given, if we're not doing it out of love, what's the point? Okay, so you guys can read ahead. And it is the love of Christ that compels us. And it's going to be the love of Christ that compels us to love our neighbors, to love the stranger, to be hospitable. So if you guys want to pray with me, um, we'll pray. We'll go through study. um, And then we're going to partake in communion at the end. And we're also, I'm doing a shorter study because we're going to be doing a thing called flock notes. It's going to be able for us to be able to serve each other and do life better together through a simple application just so we can know what's going on in the life of the body. Sound good? Awesome. Lord willing. Cool. Father, thank you for this morning. Thanks again for uh, just this time that we can open your word, God, and know that you're going to speak to us. I can't think of a Sunday where you haven't showed up, Lord, and spoken uh, to our hearts, God, and we want to be open to what you would have. So we pray that you give us ears to hear this morning. God, you have exemplified, Jesus, just how hospitality looks. Father, how you graciously loved uh, us, and you've asked us to do the same to others, and we want to we want to follow your lead, your example in that, and we pray that you'd speak to us now in your name, Amen. Amen. So we're going to consider love that is hospitable. Last week uh, we discussed um, Jesus, and we looked at the feeding of the five thousand. This morning we're going to look Old Testament, 2 Samuel chapter 7 is where we'll first start. We're going to be jumping around 2 Samuel a little bit together this morning. But we're going to look at our key character this morning, King David. How many of you guys know that King David was the most beloved of all of the kings of Israel? Okay, He was a man after God's own heart. A few years back, our men's retreat, we looked just at the life of David. Uh, He's a cool character. And one of the things that David did, and you guys can see that in the scriptures here, you can also see it in a lot of the Psalms that he wrote, he took time to reflect. And I want to ask you guys, do you take time to reflect like David did? Is he would remember the faithfulness of God, what he had done, what he was doing, what he's promised he was going to do. David did a lot of that, and it comes through uh, the different accounts in his life and also in the different um, psalms that he wrote. And what I want to look at first with you guys this morning is God himself. I'm going to pull up some slides. Um, I don't have all the scriptures down for us this morning. But there are the references, so you guys can go there. There we go. Cool. How many of you guys find these slides helpful? Yeah, very good. And you guys are online at home. Hi. 
share this morning because we're in the word. So um, we're going to look, we're going to reflect. Okay. Um, do you guys know that the, the temple, okay, was actually a tabernacle, a tent for a season of time. And this is where the people would come to meet with God and to worship. So Paul, or sorry, David, as he was reflecting there on uh, God, we read in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1, Now it came to pass when the king was dwelling in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies all around, that the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells inside tents, curtains. Okay. The Nathan said to the king, Go and do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. Isn't that a pretty cool prophetic word? Hey, God's put something in your heart, David. <laughs> Go for it. Um, now, he's reflecting on God here. And I think it's good, okay, to think about that. Because what happens when we do look to the Lord? You are worthy, okay? <laughs> you are worthy of all. You deserve. And that was in David's heart. I'm willing to sacrifice. I'm willing to do. Let's go for it. And that's what happens when we reflect rightly. But David then also reflects on his fellow man. And we're going to spend the most of our time this morning in chapter 9 together. So why don't you guys turn to uh, chapter 9 here. And we're going to consider David thinking about his fellow man. We're told in verse 1 here. Now, David said, is there still anyone who is left in the house of Saul? that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's, Jonathan's sake. So he's remembering, he's reflecting here. And you guys remember his life. Saul had a son, Jonathan. They were best buds, okay? They went to war together. They loved each other well. And as he's reflecting, and you guys remember the story, Saul was a messed up king. David was anointed to be king of Israel, and Saul was out to kill him, and that went on for years. So this morning, as we consider hospitality once together, and as we consider this account in the Old Testament, I want to consider with uh, you this morning that hospitality, how does that look to a rival? Okay, that's important. Last week, we looked at it, just like, this is what we're called to do. But what, what happens when the rubber hits the road? <laughs> what happens when there's a rival in our life? Are we also called to be hospitable to them? How about a traitor? Are we to be hospitable to a traitor? And then we're going to look at the reality of hospitality because of a covenant. And that's really what brings us all together for us this morning. So I believe that 2 Samuel 9, is this is probably the high point for King David in his life. I love this section of scripture. This is his finest hour. And here we get to witness the greatest illustration, I think, of grace in the entirety of the Old Testament. So I'm excited to get, get into this with you guys. We're going to look at a little back backstory. We're going to fill in some of the um, uh, you know, spots here to give us clarity what this looks like to be hospitable and we're first going to look at being hospitable to the rival so again let's look at chapter 9 here this possible rival okay david said is there still anyone who is left in the house of saul okay saul's now dead i am now king does he have any kids grandkids any any rivals okay why does he ask this that I may show him kindness. Whoa, for Jonathan's sake. And there was a servant in the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. So when they had called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, At your service. And the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. So the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to him, Indeed, he is in the house of Makar, the son of Emil in Lodabar. And the king David, he sent, and he brought him out of the house of Makar to the son of Emil uh, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he <laughs> fell on his face, and he prostrated himself. And then David said, Mephibosheth? 
And he answered, here's your servant. So David said to him, do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake. And I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Then he bowed himself and he said, what is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? Wow. Do you guys know that the word rival originally was used in the sense of a person using the same stream as another? That's where we literally get the like rivus stream from. So the former king's family, okay, men of antiquity were killed off to prevent rival claims to royalty. That's how they rolled back then. We're going to destroy all of you, any family. We can't have any rivals to my throne, my legacy. But did you guys catch? He showed kind. Where are my words? Yeah, there they are. Sorry. <laughs> Kindness. Did you guys see that? Wow. He should have been killed. And instead, do you guys see why this is a beautiful picture of grace? The king has shown kindness. Has said in the Hebrew, usually translated grace. He showed grace. Grace is unmerited favor. And it's extending favor to someone who doesn't deserve it, who hasn't earned it, and can never repay it. We get grace because we've been saved by grace alone, through faith alone. Right, guys? It is a gift of God. If you think you're working your way to heaven, that you're a good person, you're not reading the Bible. You're not reading what God has to say. We're not saved by being good. All of us have sinned. We need a Savior. We need a God who is gracious. And aren't you guys glad he is? I am. So we see grace being played out here. And grace is positive. This on, like unconditional acceptance in spite of this other person. And grace is a demonstration of love. Do you guys see how grace might play a part in being hospitable? Absolutely. It's undeserved, unearned, unrepayable. Guys, grace is all one-sided. All one-sided. So as we consider <clears throat> verse 3 here, there's a sad infirmity that dated back to kindergarten. Okay, You guys can jump back if you want real quick to chapter 4, verse 4. Okay, I want to give some back story here, some insight. Now Jonathan, we're told here, in chapter 4, verse 4, again, this was David's best buddy, okay? The son of Saul had a son who was crippled in his feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan had come from Jer Jer uh, Jezreel. Okay, they were killed in combat. That's what just happened. And his nurse took him up and fled. And as she fled in her haste, he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. Okay? So, verse 6, guys, uh, back in chapter uh, 9 now. Uh, picture this permanently disabled man, crippled in both his legs, throwing himself down before the king. You kind of have the picture here? Okay, got that in your mind? What's, what's going on here? Expecting the sword to strike his neck. Okay, I, I'm a son of Jonathan, a grandson of Saul. I'm a rival to this kingdom of yours, David. He was expecting to be killed. And in verse 7, he only hears these words, Do not fear. Wow. How cool, right? For I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan your father's sake, and I will restore you to all the land of, uh, of Saul your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Now this was just the first time David showed uh, hospitality to him. Okay, we're going to see it again, okay? Now, let's consider hospitality to a traitor. Let's jump all the way over to chapter 19 now. 2 Samuel 19, we're going to jump down to verse 24. 19, 24. Now, Mephibosheth, 
the son of Saul came down to meet the king. And he had not cared for his feet, nor trimmed his mustache, nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed until the day he returned in peace. So in other words, Mephibosheth was pretty gnarly at this point. <laughs> a little stinky too. Verse 24 or 25. So it was when he had come to Jerusalem to meet the king that the king said to him, Why did you not go with me, Mephibosheth? And he answered, My lord, O king, my servant deceived me. For your servant said, I will saddle a donkey for myself, that I may ride on it and go to the king, because your servant is lame. And he has slandered your servant to my lord, the king. But the lord, the king, is like the angel of God. Therefore, do what is good in your eyes. For all my father's house were but dead men before my lord the king. Yet you set your servant among those who eat at your own table. Therefore, what right have I still to cry out any more to the king? So the king said to him, Why do you speak any more of your matters? I have said, You and Ziba divide the land. Then Mephibosheth said to the king, Rather, let him take it all. Inasmuch as my lord the king has come back in peace to his own house. Now, we have a supposed traitor here. Backstory, okay? Chapter 16. Turn there. 16. Let's look at the first four verses here. When David was a little past the top of the mountain, there was Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, who met him with a couple of saddled donkeys and on them 200 loaves of bread, 100 clusters of raisins, and 100 summer fruits in a skin of wine. He had the hookups. Now, verse 2. In the king, I'm just trying to help you guys see how I read scripture. All right. Verse 2. And the king said to Ziba, what do you mean to do with these? And then Ziba said, the donkeys are the king's household to ride on and the bread and the summer fruit for the young men to eat and the wine for those who are faint in the wilderness to drink. Then the king said, and where is your master's son? And Ziba said to the king, indeed, he's staying in Jerusalem. For he said, today, the house of Israel will restore the kingdom of my father to me. So the king said to Ziba, Here, all that belongs to Mephibosheth is yours. And Ziba said, I humbly bow before you, that I may find favor in your sight, my lord, O king. So David right now is fleeing from Absalom. You guys know the story. And he meets up with Ziba and brings David these two donkeys, 200 breads, raisins, fruit, wine, now David asks, where's Mephibosheth? Where is he? And Ziba lies. And he says, behold, he remains in Jerusalem because he said, today the house of Israel will give me back the kingdom of my father. Guys, catch this because this is the second time now that David shows hospitality. Okay, 2 Samuel chapter 19 that we just read there in verse 24 and on. We see that happen. So after Absalom dies, David returns to Jerusalem. Now, Mephibosheth, he comes out to meet David, and he shows up completely disheveled, unkempt, because from the day the king departed until the day he came back in safety, he wouldn't care for himself. He didn't comb his hair. He didn't cut his hair. He didn't do his nails, his clothes. He stunk. Okay, you guys got a picture of what's going on? Now, David asks one question. <laughs> Why did you not go with me, Mephibosheth? That was the one question. And he explained how Ziba had deceived him by going out on saddle of the donkeys and took off on him. Well, did you guys catch what David said? Why speak any more of your affairs? You and Ziba, divide up the land. And Mephibosheth said to the king, let him take it all, since my lord the king has come safely home. And you can have all this world, just give me Jesus. That is the heart of Mephibosheth here. You guys see this? You can have it all. I don't care. I just want you. I love Mephibosheth. Isn't this cool? Now, 
it all comes together because of a covenant. This hospitality is shown because of a covenant. Let's go to chapter 21 together. We're going to consider now Jonathan. Look at verse 1. Now, there was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year. And David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, It is because of Saul in his bloodthirsty house, because he killed the Gibeonites. And the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but a remnant of the Amorites. The children of Israel had sworn protection to them, but Saul had sought to kill them in his zeal for the children of Israel and Judah. Therefore David said to the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? And with what shall I make atonement that you may bless the inheritance of the Lord? And the Gibeonites said to him, We will have no silver or gold from Saul or from his house, nor shall you kill any man in Israel for us. So he said, Whatever you say, I will do for you. Then they answered the king, And as for the man who consumed us and plotted against us, that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the territories of Israel, let seven men of his descendants be delivered to us, and we will hang them before the Lord in Gibeah of Saul, whom the Lord chose. And the king said, I will give them. But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the Lord's oath that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. So the king took Amorni uh, and Mishvibosheth and the two sons of Rizba, the son of the daughter of Ea, whom she bore to Saul, and the five sons of Michal and the daughter of Saul, whom she brought up from Adriel, the son of Barzillia, of the Mahalalite, and he delivered them. Yeah, when you read those things, you just act like you know how to pronounce them. Uh, verse 9, And he delivered them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them on the hill before the Lord, so they fell, all seven together, and they were put to death in the days of the harvest, in the first days, in the beginning of the barley harvest. Guys, this is the third time now. David shows hospitality. Isn't this a cool Old Testament picture for you and I? There's a lot to be gleaned here. So there was a famine in the land for three years, but David kept seeking the Lord's face. Do you guys feel like you're in a famine right now? Man, things are dry. Things are hard. Keep seeking the face of God. Okay? That's what David was doing. And then finally the Lord told him it was because of Saul and his blood guilt upon the Gibeonites. There was this ethnic cleansing that took place so it, it, wow you guys get what's going this was 30 years ago okay and god is still going to deal with this deferred retribution okay we talk about the long suffering of the lord would you say this is a long time yeah 30 years so david went and he met with the gibbonites and they said hey we want seven of saul's offspring to hang before the lord Now David said, hey, I will give them. And then the very next verse, verse 7, he says, but the king spared Mephibosheth because of the oath of the Lord that was between them, between David and Jonathan. So how do you show hospitality to a rival, to a trader, or because of a covenant? Okay? Hospitality, guys, is really a byproduct of authentic love. We can give lip service to love. I love you. I care about you. Great. Love's a verb. You guys know that? Love does something. We could say, hey, God so loved the world. Great. You're going to let us die in our sins and all go to hell? No, he did something. God so loved the world that he gave. He did his only begotten son. Okay, so when it comes to hospitality, there needs to be that authentic love. Okay, and why am I willing to love a stranger? Because I love Jesus so much more. 
It's the love of Christ that's going to compel me. He's asked me to do this, and I love him, and he loves them. Do you guys know that God loves all people? He so loved the world. Think about that. And he tells us, hey, love each other. Okay. Love your neighbor. Love the stranger. Okay. Because I love you, I will do that. So, we see here this authentic love is by us being filled with the Holy Spirit and thus overflowing in what? Kindness. You guys see how important that is? That has said that grace. Okay? And as we receive grace upon grace, why? That we can extend grace to others. And the world doesn't get that. Aren't we supposed to be selfish? Isn't it about us and building our own kingdoms? And we just want to love and give away? What's up with you Christians? You're a bunch of crazies. It's all right. Because I love Jesus. And he was crazy about you. He died for you. (laughs) Crazy's okay. (laughs) Okay? So... This is express, I mean, it's clearly expressing hospitality here, which is really the love of the stranger, even a rival, even a traitor, because of a covenant. Now, hospitality shown to us by Jesus. And this is where we'll wrap it up. As Mephibosheth guys didn't have to fear David, okay? Um, that he would keep his word. So we don't need to fear because the son of David, who is who? Jesus, all right? Jesus is the answer, guys. Okay? Um, You guys know Jesus keeps his word? All the promises in God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. All of them, okay? So as Mephibosheth didn't even know about this covenant that David had with his father Jonathan, But to David, it was sacred. It was sacred. This covenant relationship that I have with my creator is the most sacred thing in my life, guys. And I believe it's the same for you, too, who have come to faith in Jesus. There is nothing more important, even more so than your husband or your wife. Okay, this is a sacred thing. And again, we see it in 2 Samuel 9. Okay? And you guys can go back there. I just want to highlight a few things in a moment. But we, we never have known about God's redemptive covenant before. Uh, maybe you don't know. Maybe this is the first time that you're hearing about a covenant with your creator, with God. You know? But the reality is, this is a sacred thing to Jesus. Okay? I mean, he went to great lengths. He gave all of himself for this covenant. That yes, I love you. I get to do a wedding this afternoon. Okay? Isn't it cool when you got proposed to? Like, oh, you love me enough to want to be with me forever? Yeah. Pretty cool, right? And that's exactly what God's done, right? When he came and he hung upon that tree, that cross. He was saying, hey, I love you. (laughs) I love you this much. I'm willing to give all of myself for you that we can be together. I love it. But as we consider Mephibosheth, guys, he said, what is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? So when you move from, hey, I'm a pretty good person to the realization that, hey, I'm dead in my trespasses and sin. This is the reality of where I stand before the holy God, right? It's really where it all begins. Notice grace doesn't even answer his question, right? Mephibosheth's story really is our story of redemption. He belonged to a a royal line, but he was made crippled by a fall. Adam was our royal line, but he was made spiritually crippled because of a fall. He was sought by a king. We didn't find God. He found us, guys. He was lame in his feet. We're lame when it comes to power and spiritual things. You're spiritually dead until you come to Christ. He lived in exile from a king. 
Mephibosheth didn't even try to win the king's favor. He was just hiding from the king. I don't even want the king to know that I'm alive, that I'm here. I'm going to go and hide. And the same is true with us, guys. We deserved nothing. We had nothing and could offer God nothing. We are hiding when he found us. He was remembered because of a covenant. Are you guys seeing this? It was because of the covenant he was remembered. Our sin has separated us from the king. But there exists this incredible covenant. He was brought to the king. Look, verse 5. He was brought to the king. We were called into the king's presence and exalted because of the merits of another. He was called by name in verse 6. He responded in humility. Did you guys see that at the end of verse 6? And he was told not to fear in verse 7. And then he received three promises also here in verse 7. Did you guys see that? I'm going to show you kindness, restoration, and you got a great place at the table of the king. Wow. Pretty cool, right? And he responds again in humility in verse 8. There's something freeing about grace, isn't there? It's not on what I do or haven't done or how bad I've blown it again. But it's about God's grace. And because of His grace, we're free, guys. So it puts all this response on God's shoulders. Are you seeing this? And he comes to us and he says, you're mine. I take you just as you are. Crutches, your hang-ups, your liabilities, all of it. I'll take it. I'll do it. And what was given to him? You guys look in verse 9 and 10. There's a glorious heritage here that was given. He received sonship, adoption, and relationship in verse 11. Just like one of the king's sons were told. Isn't that cool? So a part of Saul's family, Mephibosheth here, had no claim to the kingdom, yet David treated him as one of his own sons, just as God has adopted every Christ follower into his family. Woohoo! Are you guys seeing gospel here? This is good. This is Old Testament. Why are we in the Old Testament? Man, it's all about Jesus, guys. Check out the second part of verse 12. Okay? He received esteem. Okay, Zeba's servants became Mephibosheth's. We read this morning before prayer time upstairs out of Ephesians chapter 1. Blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. That's what we have in Christ. Guys, if you are his, you've been given every spiritual blessing. Wow. And then we look at verse 13. He received a perpetual feast always. Think about that. I don't need to go hungry. Look what I have in Christ. Look what he has given to me continually. Makes me think of Matthew 8.11. Note takers, jot it down. Matthew 8.11. I tell you, many will come from the east and the west, and they will what? Recline at my table. This is Jesus speaking They will recline at my table with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. How cool is that? And he enjoyed uninterrupted fellowship, again in verse 13, continually. As Adam did when he walked with God in the cool of the day. Is that not going to be the coolest thing ever, guys? Just chilling with God? I can't wait is one day we will enjoy uninterrupted fellowship with God. Revelation 21.3 tells us, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. I so look forward to that, guys. We see dimly now. (laughs) But this truth, Is going to be experienced fully. Oh, I enjoy fellowship with my Heavenly Father, but how easily it is broken in this life, either by my sin or just the chaos and the fall 
the realities of it. You see, he received a seat at the king's banqueting table. That's what we're told in verse 13. So this is where the Lord covers his feet with his own tablecloth and says, hey, have a seat. Have a seat. You're mine. I chose you simply because I wanted to. I loved you because I just wanted to love you. That's who I am. I am love. So reclining, if you think about eating a meal, especially there over in the eastern part of the world, it's really a sign of fellowship, okay? And it's cool because it was a place for anyone with a disability as they recline that would be completely unnoticed. Yet, he was still lame in both his feet. No miraculous healing, okay? Still had that old nature to struggle with. But our continual problem with sin is a continual reminder of what? His grace. His grace. I like saying when it came to my salvation, you know, <laughs> I did my part and God did his part. Okay? His part, he called me, he sought me, he caught me, he loved me, he saved me, he cleansed me, he healed me, he delivered me. And my part, I was running away. That's the reality, guys. Did not God grab you? You guys ever ask the question, how am I saved? I know better people than me. He loves us, guys. It's his grace that has found us. That's why we really can call it amazing grace. What I want to do as we conclude is partake in communion together because I think this is a beautiful picture. So if I could have a couple men come up and hand out communion at this time. And I know we got a few families visiting with us this morning. We're so glad you're here at Freedom. We do an open communion. So the only thing we asked for anybody to partake of communion with us is that you actually have faith in Christ Jesus, that you are born again, that you believe the gospel. So if you are a believer... Please partake with us. If you're not, hold off. Lord willing, you'll put your faith in Jesus. All right, I don't want anybody to partake. We're going to do this together. So as we come to the Lord's table, do you guys kind of see how communion might fit into this story of Mephibosheth a little bit. Pretty beautiful picture. It's hard for us to understand or appreciate, really, um, the, the scandal Jesus caused by his table fellowship with sinners. Do you guys know that a lot of the Jewish people were tripping? Jesus! Do you know your Jesus is eating with sinners? Aren't you guys glad that he does? Yeah. Right? So to share a meal with someone is to guarantee, you know, peace, trust, right? Forgiveness. A shared table really symbolizes a shared life. And again, didn't we talk last week about hospitality? So much comes around what? Food. <laughs> Even when we get to heaven one day, I mean, the Lord's Supper, okay? Supper of the Lamb, we're going to partake in that so for an orthodox jew okay they would say hey if i'm going to share a meal with you it's like sharing we're entering into fellowship that's the point of us actually getting together it's not really the food it's to be in intimate fellowship i think it was zacchaeus you guys remember that corrupt tax collector isn't that what jesus did hey <laughs> sinner <laughs> i'm going to your house <laughs> we're gonna have a meal together and that's what he does with us. You know, hey, I want you. <laughs> We're going to be in fellowship. So why don't you guys partake of the bread here? Or don't take it yet. Just take it out. I know it's a little tricky. Some of you guys have gotten really good at this. There we go. So we know when we come to the Lord's table, okay, we do this in remembrance of him. I'm oh, sorry, that's next week. There we go. We're still considering Jesus in his table. Okay, so let's pray as we consider his bread, the life, his life. God, we want to just first of all thank you. God, and thank you that you forgive us for hiding from you. 
We thank you that you forgive us for our just being discontent with our daily bread and only being content when we have tomorrow's bread also. God, forgive us for not leaning back on you instead of trying to lean on crutches. You're right there for us, and we're thankful for that. God, forgive us for thinking that we deserve anything besides death and hell. God, and forgive us for showing pride and not humility. Lord, thank you that you did that. You did what we couldn't do. We thank you for that, and we remember your life and what you did. So let's partake of the bread together. And now, let's hold the cup and let's thank him. Father, we do thank you for calling us by name. We thank you for reminding us that we don't have to fear. We thank you for being Jehovah Jireh, that you are the God that provides. We thank you for providing your son. God is the lamb who takes away the sins of the world. We thank you for our sonship, our adoption, and our relationship with you. Thank you so much for that, God. There is nothing greater. And we do thank you for the invitation to your banqueting table continually. What a God you are. And thank you for this tablecloth of grace. In Jesus' name, let's partake of the cup together. Now, something as Christians, and this is for any of you that maybe walk in unbelief still, or you guys at home who may be watching, and you're a non-believer, you have not yet put your faith in Christ, you've been invited. I think that's the coolest thing. You have been invited. And we as believers, we get to go to the highways and the byways. And guess what? We get to throw out invites too. Hey, there's a big party. You don't want to miss it. And we get to throw out those invites. But it's on us. That's the one thing we do is we have a choice to make. We either say yes to his proposal or we say no. It'd be so foolish to say no because there is no greater love than the love that our God has for his creation for all so i sure hope that you have said yes to him well you guys see hospitality in the old testament aren't those scriptures cool very cool i hope you guys are reminded just of how much he loves us that type of sacrificial love and he asks us to share in that and to love others in that same way what a privilege